We would like to welcome you to Emory's 21 Days of Peace, that this is actually the final culminating event uh, of those 21 days, and we've had a series of outstanding programs that have been put on by the Institute for Developing Nations and also sponsored by the Carter Center and Emory Campus Life. One of the things as you participate in this final event is that we would like for you to uh, get your Twittering on, and uh, we have hashtag Emory, 21 Days of Peace, and hashtag Peace Day Challenge as ways that you can tweet out what questions you may have or thoughts that you have pertaining to the event. So once again, thank you for coming out, and I would like to introduce the folks who will be participating in our conversation for this evening. The first, Jason Carter is in fact the perfect embodiment of the way in which we've come to conceptualize the 21 days of peace here at Emory because he has built peace both locally and globally by connecting us to what we can do right here, right now, in our local communities and beyond. We are thrilled and honored that he could join us as, our, as one of our speakers in our final event this evening. It can't get any more local than Jason Carter. He was born right here at Emory University's hospital. He was, in fact, an outstanding debater in high school, and I just realized was a semifinal round participant at one of the most prestigious debate tournaments that you have in the United States, the Barclay Forum for High School tournaments that we host here in January. He is the grandson of President Carter and First Lady Rosalind Carter. Jason Carter lived through the essence and is an everyday example of what it's like to be a peacemaker. I believe it is like these kinds of experiences that led him to be a major in both philosophy and political science while he was at school at Duke University where he obtained his Bachelor of Arts. Thereafter, he pursued his passion in peace and justice by serving in the Peace Corps while stationed in South Africa where he worked on educational issues in the rural areas of that country. He learned to speak Zulu while there and ultimately wrote a book, Power Lines, about his experiences in that community. With the desire to continue to pursue his passions for justice, Jason later attended the University of Georgia School of Law, graduating summa cum laude with a Juris Doctorate degree in 2004. From 2010 to 2015, he served in the Georgia Senate. In 2014, Jason was the Democratic nominee for governor of Georgia, receiving more than 1.1 million votes in that race, and I'm proud to say that one of those was mine. Wish there were 100,000 votes. <laughs> Jason has received numerous awards for his legal work and community service, including awards from the Anti-Defamation League, Yeah, I should have, the Anti-Defamation League for his pro bono work in defending voting rights and the Fulton County Daily Report in 2009 on the rise recognized him as one of the top attorneys in Georgia under 40. Currently, he also serves as the chair of the Carter Center's Board of Trustees. Jason Carter. We also have with us this evening some outstanding student peace builders who will be participating in a larger conversation. Iabu Onepeti is a graduate of Georgetown University School of Law and the Candler School of Theology here. She is a facilitator for the Fearless Dialogues and a leadership development coach. Fearless Dialogues, founded by our very own Dr. Gregory C. Ellison II, is a grassroots nonprofit initiative committed to creating unique spaces for uniquely partners that, so that they can engage in the hard, heartfelt conversations that see gifts in others and hear the value in their stories and work for change and positive transformation in ourselves and others. Our other student peace builders, Chris and Peter Dixon. They are Cuban Americans from Miami, Florida, as brothers, they are committed to continuing the legacy of what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. noted as true peace, the presence of justice and brotherhood, and building a beloved community across cultural differences. Currently, 
They are working with Emory Center for the Advancement of Nonviolence on a curriculum that addresses police violence and starting a nonprofit called Brothers for Peace. Originally from Indonesia, Sarah Muhuwadi is a doctoral student in the Graduate Division of Religion here at Emory University. She herself is a scholar activist concentrating in religion in West and South Asia. Her research focuses on Sunni and Shia conflict and coexistence in Indonesia. Muhawadi's dissertation explores how Indonesians, Shias, and Sunnis attempt to reduce the discord between the two communities in their everyday lives. She is also a current fellow for the ELMO Initiative, a collaborative between the Carter Center, the Institute for Developing Nations, and the Laney Graduate School. Please welcome our student peace builders. The way that our, the rest of the presentation and events will occur is that we will start with a presentation from Jason Carter, and then we will move to a five minute presentation by each of the three groups about their program and then a conversation between them. Thank you. Um, can you all hear me? Oh look, my mic is working. You were totally right, George. Um, I am not going to stand at the podium if that's all right. Um, what I was hoping for today, and I think you're going to see, uh, is a dialogue between all of us. Um, and the, this group that's sitting up here, who I've had the chance to spend a little bit of time with today, uh, it's a remarkable group. And just to kick it off, I was um, just going to say a, a few brief words about some of the examples of people acting uh, in their own ways for peace. And I, I have a couple. Uh, I've chosen two from my life, and they're both grandparents. One of them is my um, grandfather, Carter, who some of you know and have heard of at a minimum. Um, but he has spent his life, as many of you know, in, in pursuit, in my view, of, of peace. And to give you a brief update on him, uh, sort of from a health standpoint, because I've had at least two people ask me already how he's doing, uh, he's doing remarkably well. Some of you may know that my grandfather was diagnosed with cancer last August. Uh, and has been treated here at, at Emory. Uh, and since that time, and you know, we watched him go through this uh, as a family, and one of the most remarkable things that I've seen him do uh, is walk into the room with all of his children and, and the grandchildren that were there. And you know, because it's him, there was some staff and some Secret Service and other people that I had to talk to. But and he said, look, I have uh, medical news, and it is that I have melanoma on my liver that they've removed, and I have four uh, melanoma tumors on my brain. Um, he said, and when I, he said, when I first heard that news, uh, I thought I wasn't going to get to finish the book that I'm reading. He said, and I was totally at peace with that. And it's just a remarkable thing to look at, because none of us in the room doubted for one second that he was totally at peace, given the way that he's lived his life, given his faith, given the spiritual grounding on which he sits. Uh, it, it was as impressive to me as anything else that he's done. Um, he, as you may know, was President of the United States. He won the Nobel Peace Prize, um, has done other things uh, that, that have been well known, and certainly around Emory, well, well regarded. At, and the work of the Carter Center also. Before I go too far down this road, I have to say he's just also a normal guy. Uh, and so to the extent he's just like y'all's grandparents, to the extent that y'all's grandparents are sort of rednecks from South Georgia. <laughs> um, he, um, in fact, just literally the other day, so he, so we call him Papa in my family. And um, so my phone rings and it says Papa Mobile. And I was like, oh, you know, hey Papa, how are you? And he said, who is this? I said, it's Jason. And he said, what are you doing? I said, you just called me. He said, I didn't call you. I'm taking a picture. I was like, <laughs> I was like no, you're not. But I'll let you, I'll let you get back to that uh, if, you, if you can. So yeah, I mean, leader of the free world, whatever. Um, uh, whatever, it's technology. It's hard. He's not a millennial. Um, but he'll, he'll, be, he'll be 92 um, this year in October. And my grandparents just celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. Which, and you know, you can say there's people who've won the Nobel Peace Prize who, who were unhappy, and there's people, certainly people who were president who were unhappy, and there's tons of people that you all know who've been successful in all these ways and had a terrible uh, personal life in all these ways, but there's not a human being, I don't think, who's ever had a 70th anniversary 
who wasn't a happy person. It just says so much about who they are. My, my grandfather attributes it to his expertise in conflict resolution. <laughs> my grandmother attributes it to her expertise in mental health, and so they, <laughs> they get along great. But, but he has done a remarkable amount, and what the Carter Center is doing now is broadly defining peace, the true peace that you described and that I'm excited to hear about from you all. One element, and one of the ways that the Carter Center does that is it broadly defines human rights to include not just peace, but health, alleviation of, un, of, of human suffering, understanding that you can make a difference in your own life, trying to ensure that people uh, who, who, who live throughout the world um, have the kind of opportunities uh, that allow them to lead a full, a full life. And, and that has led to the Carter Center's programs in numerous countries. The Carter Center has observed 103 now elections, um, many of which were were established and, and, and performed in order to bring peace to, to a place like Liberia or to uh, you know, places like Nicaragua and other uh, of these transitional democracies uh, that, that we believe and that the Carter Center believes that, that instituting a free and fair election is a good way uh, to get to the beginning uh, of, of the kind of peace that, that we all want. So 103 elections over time is a remarkable um, remarkable number. The other way in which they, they operate in addition to the peace programs which are named as such. The health programs of the Carter Center are uh, equally important. And as I said, I believe bound up in peace uh, in a very fundamental way. And th those programs uh, will become uh, or will have led in the next few years a charge to eradicate uh, the second human disease ever eradicated, which is guinea worm disease. Um, and in the 1980s, when they began, there were three and a half million cases of guinea worm disease in the world. Uh, across Asia, Africa, essentially the poorest places in the world. Uh, in 2014, from three and a half million in the 1980s, in 2014 there were 126 cases, which is amazing. And the, the, this year, there have been six. And what that means is that there's literally, in the next two years, and by the way, those six are in Chad, southern Sudan, uh, eastern part of Mali, although Mali has not had a single reported case this year, um, and the very western edge of Ethiopia. And if you want to find the most difficult places in the world to get to, uh, you can look at the places that still have guinea worm disease, <laughs> because that's the only reason that they're still there. And, and the, the amazing thing about the guinea worm eradication program is that they didn't do it with medicine, they didn't do it with a vaccine like smallpox, they did it purely by teaching people and changing behaviors in all these little communities. And what that means is that in every single one of those communities where there is no more guinea worm disease, every single village in Nigeria, you know, has had somebody in that community who led the guinea worm eradication program for their community. And what that means, and that's true for every single village in Uganda and every single village uh, throughout the rest of Africa and, and in Asia where they've had guinea worm disease, all of these places now have people who have successfully changed their own community from a public health standpoint. And they did it by educating people, teaching people to filter their water, et cetera. But what we've left behind as the disease has gone is people who understand that they have credibility and power to make a change in their community. And so when we go back and say, let's talk about trachoma, we go back and say, let's talk about uh, onchocerciasis or river blindness or elephantiasis or the other diseases that we're talking about. There's credibility and there's a network of people there uh, who have the, the, the trust of their, of their of their, um, you know, colleagues and friends and neighbors, and it's a, it's a truly uh, an amazing endeavor that's essentially just grassroots organizing. And if you think about that, it's it's the, the power of individual people is really remarkable. Um, those are sort of macro things that 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 grandparent has done. Um, the other thing he did when I graduated from college is at the sand is I he said if I were you I'd go to the Peace Corps, so I did. I went to South Africa, um, and I lived in a tiny little community where people carried their water from the river and built their houses out of sticks and mud, and it was just, you know, Mandela was still the president. I mean, this was right after apartheid. It was, the, the wounds of that were still so fresh, and the people who have, uh, you guys all know, sort of the, the, the insidious nature of the apartheid system, that it defined people by race, and then allocated to them places where they could live, allocated to them jobs, allocated to them sort of an education system that was designed to teach people in accordance with their opportunities in life. And that was what the statute says. We'll teach people in accordance with their opportunities in life. What that meant is that in black schools, 
they were teaching people how to follow instructions, but not how to do much public speaking. Uh, they were teaching people, you know, from a, a uh, even like the reading comprehension was about working in a mind instead of doing other things. I mean, it, it was all designed to teach people to live within this terrible system. Um, and that brings me to the second grandparent that I was going to talk about, and then I'll talk briefly, and then we'll turn it over to the people who are doing things now. But it, when I got so this, this, so we called her Gogo, which is a Zulu word for grandmother. Clearly, Zulu is my very best party trick, and I'm going back to South Africa next month for this conference on um, democracy in Africa, and I'm a little nervous that it's so rusty that uh, it's going to be embarrassing, but y'all don't know, so I'm going to do it for you. Um, uh, that last part is about my frog and some traditional beer, but it has a lot of clicks in it. Um, the, uh, but... Um, it, it, it sounds great. The Zulu word for grandmother, though, is go go. And so we, the, I rented a room uh, from this woman named Selena Nzugulu that we called her go go. And she lived her whole life constrained by apartheid, as I described, right? She was born in, and lived in a location that was, the, that was denoted for black people. She had the education that I described. She then went and worked at a sweater factory in Pretoria because that's one of the jobs that was reserved for her. Uh, she then was a maid for a white family. And then in 1975, which is the year I was born, she was forcibly removed from her home in, in the township outside Pretoria and taken out into the middle of nowhere and dropped off. And I got there 23 years later, and she had lived in this community, again, where they carried their water from the river and they built their houses out of sticks and mud, literally. And she was the chairperson of the school governing body. She was the postmaster. She was the landlord of a facility that had a dressmaker and a shoe repair place and a general store and a gas station and a mechanic. Um, she had a certain number of head of cattle that she managed her on her own. She had gotten an award from the United Nations for a women's gardening project that she had funded and then performed. She ran the church out of her house and the women's group met there on Wednesdays and the church met there on Sundays. She um, I said she was the postmaster, right? Um, she also had a preschool which is how she really spent her time. And what she did for that preschool is she sat up at night and wrote applications by hand for government grants. And she had 60 kids. And they came to his preschool. She taught them English and math. And she, she fed them three times a day. And for almost all those kids, that was the only time they ate. And what I think about when I think about Gogo -Go is what would she have done you know, if she had been Jimmy Carter's grandson? or if she had gotten to go to Emory, or even if she had been born in the United States instead of in South Africa, right? I mean, like the, the, the way in which she tackled her community and like added to that community and believed in herself and her ability to be a change agent is just incredible. And all of us, I mean, I don't know anything about the people who are sitting here, really. Those of you who go to this school or who have graduated from this school, what I know is that you've now gone to college. What I know is that you're very unlikely to starve, right, to death in your life. You know, you're gonna have a good job if you want it. You live in this country, you live here in 2016 and not in 1916, right? So you're probably not gonna uh, die of a disease that can be cured with antibiotics. <laughs> you know, there are so many benefits that people right now have, the tools that that this generation of people have been given, uh, all of us who live here now, it's just incredible. I mean, and, and I, I, would, I, I was talking the other day to a school, and then this is the last thing I'm going to say, and I'll sit down, but if you think about the tools that this generation has for connecting to each other, the tools that we have for, for bringing people together, for, for facilitating understanding, it's really remarkable. I mean, we, we, one of the things I did in the Carter Center, one of the elections that we observed was in Egypt several years ago, and you sat down, and we can all talk about where Egypt is today and the fact that there's been a lot of backsliding and that, these, that, that, that the democracy didn't take hold the way that we had hoped that it would. But what you can't ever change is the fact that there was a guy named Ghosty Mar who led the student revolution. And the reason they call him Ghosty Mar is because he was an online gamer and that was his handle like when he played Halo <laughs> with people from all over the world, right? And Ghosty Mar on Facebook and Twitter started a revolution that took down a military regime in Egypt that had been there for a half a century. And yes, they've backslid in Egypt, but you cannot deny that that power still exists out there for people right now to be able to connect in ways that just are unheard of before. 
I mean, you know, even today, the people that I'm going to go see in a couple of weeks in South Africa, you know, go go, like they hit me up on Facebook all the time. Hey, what are you, what are you coming back? Hey, can you do this for us? Hey, can you? and I just think it, it's amazing that that this is what we've been given right now. The, and the other the other way in which I think that has manifested itself in this country is if you think about the most important civil rights leaders of our time in the United States, the people who have driven and changed the course, for example, of the Black Lives Matter movement the most, it hasn't been preachers or political leaders. It has been regular citizens with phones who have recorded incidents. And, and it just means that all of us who are here have so much power to make change that we all have to figure out what to do with it. And I, I always joke, you know, I, one of the things that I, I had to speak at some graduations for a year, and I told everybody I was going to tell them the secret to wealth and power, and everybody laughed. But it's true. I mean, the secret to wealth and power is exactly Gogo's secret, essentially, which is the secret to wealth and power is knowing and recognizing that you have it. Then you have to figure out what you're going to do with it, right? And if you're in this room today, you have it because you've got the ability to do this, you're here at this moment in this time, you've got this kind of connections, you know how to show up at events, it, it, and you believe you can make a difference in your life. And, and I think that the way that you're gonna hear this group talk and the way hopefully that we'll talk later is just about what we do to take advantage of those opportunities that we have. And then conclusion, which I've now said three times, um, and I apologize, it's the Baptist church in me. Um, in that church where I grew up, there was a uh, memorial plaque on the wall and it said, there's these all over the place, but it, it was for a woman who had, who had passed away in the like 1930s, and it said, she had done what she could. And at first, I thought that that was kind of a put down, you know? Well, you know, she did everything she could, you know? Mm -hmm. And then you think about how many people actually take advantage of the opportunities that they have in their lives. And how many people can say, like, I think, I frankly think Jimmy Carter can do that. You know, I've taken advantage of the opportunities. I've done what I can. And if, if the rest of us can say that about what we've done for peace or in our communities to make people and to bring people together, um, then, then we'll all be better off. But that, that's, my, that's my opening volley. Um, and I'm really excited to hear uh, from the rest of these folks and then excited to hear from you guys. But it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you very, very much. And um, I'll sit down now, but thanks. So I'm, I'm Chris, and this is my brother, Peter. And uh, I'm, we're just going to share a little bit about the work that we do, and I'm going to share an insight, and then he'll follow up the conversation. Um, one of the things that we've learned really comes from a poet, uh, Charles Baudelaire, uh, who is an artist, an art critic, and a deep poet. But he, he writes in one of his poems, The Flowers of Evil, um, about a man, and the man says in the poem that I am the knife in the wound. Um, he says, I am the knife in the wound. And, and I took it, actually to read it last uh, semester in an art and acts of justice class um, with a professor on campus. Uh, and the insight for us um, that no matter what context or room that we're stepping into, that people are wounded that we have our, our experience of wounds and that we are either acting out in those wounds, that we are knifing others or we are deeply more wounding ourselves. And this sort of framework um, really informs how we view conflict and how we view our own relationships. And one sort of principle that we, we work and he'll talk a little bit more about how we implement it, that is conflict that isn't transformed is transmitted. And so our own wounding and our own experience of our wounds and conflict will be, continue to be um, transmitted until we seek to transform that. And so, yeah. So uh, within that framework, um, we begin to kind of, in every workshop that we do, we ask this question, what is violence? Um, and then sometimes I will contextualize a little differently because we uh, also do workshops with elementary school kids. So we'll ask them, what conflict do you experience? Or kind of, what are your daily struggles? And then that question becomes the motor in which we kind of take the discussion. Um, we see in which um, these, uh, the, so we go and um, we talk 
uh, to prominently like middle school, high schoolers, um, elementary school, and then college students, and then also um, faith-based communities. And then we ask them these questions to kind of help them navigate their areas of conflict and where they've seen their barriers to brotherhood. Uh, one of the things kind of has been mentioned throughout this talk is that we say that um, true peace is a presence of justice and brotherhood. And a lot of times we don't kind of take the times to reflect on those experiences of those barriers that allow us to really experience that genuine sense of community so that we kind of go out and engage in justice or engage in other things that don't allow us to kind of reflect and see these times that we're kind of missing the community that we have shared between us. Um, so a lot of times when we go into these communities, they have these great sense of what they want to do, such as in educational uh, schools. They want to kind of teach kids how to learn and such, engage in a certain justice mission. But if a child is being bullied, they, that's not an environment for them to learn in or engage in. So it's beginning to see these different barriers and ways in which we can engage kind of these peaceful discussions to create more of a, a generative environment to engage in learning, to engage in the side of justice that we want to see within our cities. Yeah, if you want to add. Yeah, and I think that understanding of, of positive peace or true peace being the presence of justice and brotherhood, one thing that we've really kind of come to understand lately is that justice needs sort of that aesthetic dimension that justice, when it's devoid of the arts, will um, inhibit actually the work of justice, of true justice to emerge in communities. They need arts because um, one of our professors in, who taught us nonviolence and conflict resolution, Bernard Lafayette, talks about how violence is the language of the inarticulate. And so if we need to articulate ourselves, but we don't have the right language, um, arts have been the best way to, to do that. And so. We've seen uh, this generation, our generation, the need for raising up poets and dreamers to actually give them the language and the tools to articulate themselves in a constructive way. Because if they don't have that, conflict will continually be destructive and will actually tear at the fabric of what communities, schools, churches, institutions like this love to build. Yeah, and then kind of going off that, we're in the process of developing a curriculum that kind of blends literacy and arts in order to talk about social emotional health. Um, for elementary school students. That's so, our work. Yeah, Thank you all. That's us, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
and we also like do a, some peace building training for the students. But this was like five years ago. We we still doing that in different school, but then the theme always changing. Like five years ago, it is human rights and Islam, but then uh, nowadays, I mean, I think nowadays what they have is multiculturalism and anti-sectarianism because sectarianism is kind of like increasing in Indonesia. And three years ago, it was about anti-radicalism. So uh, by doing this, we kind of like expanding our network by replicating maybe some structure but different issues and with different people. Uh, that's mostly local. But I also, we, I do some global projects, mostly it's about interfaith exchange. Uh, when I was there, I managed three or four interfaith exchanges with Indonesia and UK Islamic leaders and also inter interfaith leaders. And it's kind of fun because people think that Muslim community around the world are very monolithic. But there are so much diversity even between us. So when the Imam come from Britain, come to Indonesia, they can learn something. And Indonesian leaders, there are two programs, one Muslim leaders and one interfaith leaders. They can also like run, uh, learn how you manage diversity within different contexts. And if you think that Islam doesn't have room for female leadership, you should see me actually like herding those imam around. <laughs> and they're basically my child when, you know, my children during those weeks. <laughs> and uh, we also give consultancy, consultancy to diplomats and embassies who want to uh, build projects in Indonesia. And we work with Indonesia Ministry of Foreign Affairs for foreign policy related to religion and culture. My academic work, I think like, I feel fortunate because I can relate my NGO works with my academic work. My research mostly, I try to do research in like grassroots mar uh, marginal society, or at least research that related to minority rights and minority issues. Uh, for instance, I did research in Indonesia, the Philippines, and Malaysia. In the Philippines, I uh, researching on power tensions and negotiation within interfaith peacebuilding efforts in southern Philippines. I mean, in more general world, it's like people think that, oh, the Muslim in southern Philippines, they don't like to be in the interfaith dialogue because it is not their culture. But I went there, I talked with them, I researching them, and apparently there's like so much questions like, who actually running this interfaith? Is this project even friendly for us? Is this project recognize our culture? Or this project somehow feel like another cultural colonizations? Because sometimes people have a good, good idea, but when they don't actually trying to understand, you know, their partner, you know, they can just, they don't get, they, they cannot achieve their goal. And uh, now for my dissertation research, I am researching on how sectarian tension between Sunni and Shia in Indonesia is aggravated by the Middle East geopolitics. So even though Indonesia is far away, but this conflict really, really affect us. Uh, it shaped identity politics within Muslim and also the broader Indonesian communities because Indonesia is a democratic country, but now people are trying to shape us like we are Sunni country. It is true that we have largest Sunni majority, but this kind of sectarian consciousness wasn't there before. And I'll try to still tying not only about topics, but like for instance, I know that my writing will be published in international journal. Maybe people that I work with actually cannot read you know, my writing and my outcome. So my NGO network, help me in that like they actually and I, when i was there like i wrote some of the, my writing to be like more accessible article in like free journals so that religious leader can also know about these issues and can approach these issues in more rational and intellectual way rather than you know seeing propaganda from the media or others okay thank you Good evening, and thank you for having me. My name is Iyabo Onikpede. I just graduated from, Emory, from Candler School of Theology with a Masters of Divinity. 
And I'm here with two hats. Let me tell you about the first one. Fearless Dialogues is a grassroots movement founded by Dr. Gregory Ellison II, who is an associate professor of pastoral care at Candler University. This movement creates unique spaces for unlikely partners to have hard, heartfelt conversations. Let me break that down for you. He wrote this book called Cut Dead But Still Alive. Cut Dead But Still Alive. And it was geared towards young African American men who are walking around like zombies, not being seen, not being acknowledged, and they're cut dead. I think it's a William James, a psychologist's notion in one of his books about being cut dead but still alive, so you're just this shell. And so he was in Kansas, I think, and was going to give this talk one Friday evening, you know, Party USA on a campus, college campus uh, setting. And the room was filled with the residents of the nursing home next door <laughs> and no young people. And when he get, got done with his lecture, they said, we feel cut dead but still alive. Our kids put us in this nursing home. And then he started to realize that this focus he was bringing to young African-American men, many other kinds of groups felt it. So he designed Fearless Dialogues. Any Fearless Dialogues experience is a, it's called the laboratory of discovery. You don't know what's gonna happen. He is a creative genius and you don't know what's gonna happen, but you're gonna have some real conversations. One of the things we're big on, the, the area I work in with him, I started as his, I took a class from him my first semester. I started as his research assistant. I've worked with him for two years, and now I just graduated in May, and I work with him part-time with Fearless Dialogues because I so believe in the work as peace building. It is peace building soul by soul. One of the things we invest a lot of our energy in in Fearless Dialogues is getting you to take that suit off, the suit, the psychological armor that we are taught to wear in society, right, that hides our souls, that helps us not really be real people. You know, these suits, these roles that we play, we live into them and we live up to them and we think that's all of who we are. But you know, we're over at the seminary, so we have to take care of the soul part. And personally, separate from the organization and what Fearless Dialogues does, I work as a leadership development coach. I believe our leaders are our most vulnerable. Ever thought about that? Our leaders are our most vulnerable. This came about for me because I was in a church where the pastor got caught up in some foolishness. It doesn't matter what. And the only question I had was, who did he have to talk to? We put our pastors, our presidents, our leaders on these invisible pedestals, and we don't allow them to be human. I'm so grateful, Jason, you talked about your grandfather as a person who's technology, technologically inept and dials instead of, you know, that we need to see our leaders like that. Our leaders have a tremendous responsibility, but they're the most vulnerable, and that's why my personal work focuses on them. Peace building starts with the individual. Jason talked about the broader picture of peace building, and so did Sarah, about how we, um, did I get that right? Your first name is Sarah, okay. And uh, the brothers, how we, we're moving systems, right? We're moving systems, countries, religions, institutions. Where is the person in it? The suicide rate among religious leaders is very high. Depression is remarkably astronomical in, in the social justice movement. These are issues that people are facing that are on the front lines of building peace. And so what we do in Fearless Dialogues is to, we equip people to have these amazing conversations that helps you go from being able to do conflict resolution 
to move, to have the space, the capacity to conflict transformation. That's all I have to say. <laughs> I'm so excited to, to be here with you all and, and to hear the international discussions. And I'm not, I'm not sure what's next. I, I would hope we could take some questions. And if you guys have some, great. I, I have one for you, but I, I don't want to jump in first. But I will. <laughs> this is what leadership looks like, right? You go first. <laughs> um, to, I, I'm interested just on a, on a, on a personal level in what what you said about leaders and even what you said about the imams that, that you take around. And um, you know, the, the, I, I think that, that you know, no matter who it is that, that I've seen that has been a leader or someone who's out there trying hard uh, for peace, even Gogo, you know, she felt like she was totally isolated in her community because everybody kind of looked to her and said, oh, you know, you're somebody who's out here doing this, and, and you know, and, and the work that she did was a lot of times with a candle in the middle of the night, you know. Um, I, I am interested to know what, what you guys think, and this is a purely personal question for me, um, because I, I, I do think that the way our politics is designed, certainly, it isolates leaders from regular people. And I think when that happens, on a macro level, you start seeing that, that it's much easier to go to war, for example, when you don't have the kind of connection to, to, to the average everyday person that you need. It's much easier to hate somebody when you feel alienated from them. And like those different types of alienation that are out there, um, I think to me are, are almost essentially what, what we're all talking about combating when we talk about peace. And your comment about how leaders are sometimes the most isolated and alienated really struck that to me. But what, what we talk about that a little bit more, and then will y'all react to that? Because I'm interested to know in the religious community or, or elsewhere, sort of how that that alienation, not just among leaders, but among you know even even school leaders, you know, young kids who people look up to, uh, who feel like they're out there by themselves. What what that means? Because I I think that's a fascinating thing to me, and I don't mean to hijack the conversation. And then we can take whatever other questions there are. Go ahead. Thank you for asking that. Um, one of the things we do in Fearless Dialogues is when you come in, you don't get a name tag. The name tags that are laid out are one of seven gifts, and you get to pick that gift, and you get to sit in a group with your gift. And we have had so much amazing feedback. We've done fearless dialogues at places like Leadership Atlanta. We have a school, a private school, I don't want to give out names, where we're doing this with staff and parents and personnel, and we required maintenance to be there. Right. That's how we do fearless dialogues. And then people get to take off their jackets and talk th through in terms of their gifts. When I see you as a gift, I don't get to try and manipulate you. I don't get to try and just get what I can out of you. But when I see you as a role, as the one that writes the grants at, with the candle at midnight, then I just want what you can give. I don't see your humanity. I see your doingness, it's not your beingness. It's a role. So that, those are the kinds of things that we just focus on breaking down person by person, conversation by conversation. Our heart is with the hearts of people, like what really makes you a person. We're seminarians. We don't do church. We don't, you know, it's not just church stuff, but it, it's living out well, the aspects of our faith that we feel are valid. And interfaith dialogue using those methods are like our thing. We get really excited about that. But alienation is a, is, is a key thing for leaders because leaders tend to be highly visionary and they carry people with them. They tend to have charisma and vision. And a lot of times people just see what the solutions those things are and not just the person behind that dream and that vision. Do you want to respond or do you want them to go? Yeah, I think I yeah. would like to respond a bit. Yeah, because I think uh, there are like different life of leadership and uh, the more higher you are, the more alienated you are in a way. Uh, but I think that's when civic society organization and scholar actually can take 
responsibilities and advantage by their middle positions to connect and to make sure that the leader is not being alienated. Uh, for instance, like I was lucky, my NGO is also it's called by Carter Center. It's based on uh, on like great men who have access to the president and everybody who want to run presidents in Indonesia usually want to come to him to kind of like have his blessings and things. Uh, so because we have that great access, we make sure that we actually have a good informants of what's going on. We have like our research divisions that we can also, when we have that access, we're not only giving like a symbolical meeting, but actually using it as our leverage to make sure that the leader hear us or hear the voice of the minority people through us. I think it's mostly like what your organization do, like you're, like you're collecting stories and make sure that it is being heard and the leader, we knock the door for the leader, we like screaming in their ears. I mean, yeah, or we can be the leader ourselves, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you, you can be the leader yourself, I'm sure about that. <laughs> Just to add, I think uh, one thing, a theologian and, and leader I look up to, John Valle, um, he leads this movement called Larsh, it's with persons with disabilities, but he, he reflects on watching the Special Olympics one time, and he's watching uh, a young man sprint the 100 meter race, and he's watching this kid about to win, and the kid looks around and sees that the person behind him had fallen, and the kid goes back and picks him up, and they, they finish the race together. And Vanier, kind of reflecting on that, poses the question, and I think it's, it's true for our work, and it's true for every classroom we walk into, but he asks, do we want to win or do we want to be in solidarity? And I think that question of competition, what's going on here, of leadership, like for me, I learned early on playing tennis as a captain of a tennis team that leadership is lonely. And like that desire to win, that competitive edge really furthers you often from solidarity. Um, and then Vanier kind of writes later that the glory of human beings is to allow what's deepest in us to grow. And to really, and as we walk into schools and classrooms, we go in with a veil of ignorance. We, we have to kind of blind ourselves that these kids are actually artists. And what we're going in to do is to see their gifts. And I love the Fearless Dialogues work because it's so at the heart of that, of like these are their gifts. and. We're just calling them out as artists and watching that grow. That's so cool. Go ahead. I don't mean to treat you as a unit. I think I would love to hear what you have to say. <laughs> so one of the things that I've realized is that culture really stunts our capacity to kind of imagine what life could look like connected. And one of the things, an exercise that we do, uh, one of our friends showed us, was we have all these hoops, uh, like uh, hula hoops, at the corners of four corners of the room, we put all the balls in the center of the room. And we tell people um, the goal, and we, and we and we break people up into like four groups. And we and then we tell people the goal is to get your balls in the hoop. Um, but what people usually do is they very much focus on getting their balls in the hoop that they try to get. So they're just competing for the resources. But in reality, they could just kind of restructure the system of kind of putting all the hoops together and then putting all those balls in the hoops. If that like visually makes sense. Um, but I think we just, as a culture, we, we, we're just so inundated with competition, um, the different ways we've kind of lacked that capacity to connect because of the narratives that we tell each other. And I think leadership has fundamentally always, as my brother was saying, we don't we always want to try to compete, like the best leader, kind of the awards we try to get. Most votes, whatever. Yeah. Do any of y'all have questions? It's been super compelling to me. Yes. And we'd say your name at least. Yeah, and yeah. Hi, and whatever name. else you'd like to say about yourself. <laughs> Hi, my name is Bethany. I'm from the UK and I'm studying Masters in Development Practice here. So this is uh, a lot of ideas that we're engaging with. And um, I wanted to ask you, I feel at the moment politics um, have be has become very like conflict driven in terms of dehumanizing different people. The two examples of this are your current presidential election, it's very much become us and them and rather than focusing on like theories of government, if, if that makes sense. Or for example, from the more for whom um, Brexit was very much about dehumanizing certain ethnic groups rather than looking at theories of 
um, international politics we want to be like part of a big thing or something. So I was just wondering, this is for me uh, leads to lots of issues of um, how we see our fellow human beings. Um, and what role does your different organizations and your theories of peace um, have to play here in Atlanta or here uh, globally in re kind of kindling those relationships? That's kind of a long winded question, but I hope that makes sense. No, I th I, and I, I think that that's part of the what, what we've been confronting is there's just a real sense of, of alienation, of there's a group out there that's different than me and I want to keep my distance. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, that a lot of our politics and your politics um, and many, many other politics, and you, know, you can tell me more about Indonesia or, or about Nigeria or other places, um, but so much of that has been built on the, um, this idea that we want to maintain that distance uh, and that we're sort of in, entrenching alienation. I mean, that's the knife in the wound, right? I mean, it keeps making it worse. Um, but I, I certainly see that. I'll let you guys respond before I talk too much about politics. But I'll, I, you can come back to me if you want to hear my take on uh, American politics. I'll give it to you. <laughs> what do you think about that? So there's a narrative. And what do you do to fix it? That's, oh, a, that's a better question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> so, Please uh, solve our problem. <laughs> I'll try my very best with my yeah. experiences, very short-lived experiences. Uh, there's a narrative that uh, my brother and I tell, which is kind of the first thing that popped in my head, and it's um, called St. Francis and the Wolf. It's um, about St. Francis of Assisi. And um, in the story, there's a town. Um, they're, they're being traumatized by this wolf. Um, and then, but uh, the, the, the townspeople call St. Francis and because uh, they want to, the, the wolf to kind of leave or maybe go somewhere else uh, to, hurt, to hurt someone else, uh, their, their enemies. And then, uh, but St. Francis approaches the wolf and kind of hears the narrative in this story. Um, and I think one of the things that I think I take away from that story is the way in which kind of you're saying kind of the rhetoric, of the, de the dehumanization um, that I think is present, present within kind of our time of seeing other groups of people as a certain categorical narrative of just kind of this is the way they act. Like if we're in the story of the wolf, uh, as the as the story spread about the wolf, the 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 fangs got longer and like the wolf got bigger and bigger. It became more ferocious. And I think the same way we t we tell stories about other groups is that um, the, the 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 narrative gets bigger and bigger. They become scarier and scarier and just becomes in our imagination. But it's really I think. For me, what I've always kind of tried to figure out to do is really kind of calm myself and listen to the stories of the people who are hurt. Because later in that story, uh, what they find out about the wolf is that the wolf was wounded, and it had to hunt by um, it had to hunt by the village, and that's why the village was present there. So it, it was kind of going back to the knife and the wound, where there's there's kind of these these wounds that we kind of operate from, um, or kind of these unseen securities about kind of people that we don't know about. Um, just something that we kind of, becomes this cycle that we kind of wound each other. So yeah, um, understanding kind of the rhetoric that's in place and kind of looking through that. I don't know if that. No, no, I, you want to comment on it? Yeah. I think you used the perfect word, humanizing. I think you used dehumanizing, but the antithesis of that is perfect. And I think that's the work we're all doing in different ways. When you s make it a point to eradicate guinea worm that's killing babies, you're saying, I see your humanity. When you say, I'm creating a curriculum to go into schools to teach children and their educators to see the humanity of the children, you're teaching, you're, you're teaching humanity 101. When you say, you, you know, you talk about the Islamic clerics and creating peace on the ground in Muslim countries. You're saying we're all human, and it's the same. That's what Fearless Dialogues is about, is saying, I can talk to you. We can reach a place of really seeing each other. The mantra in Fearless Dialogues is see, hear, change. And once you see, you cannot unsee. And so I think Every single person in this room is a peace builder. A, you're here. Obviously, you're interested. B, thank you for coming out. <laughs> and C, 
you want to find ways to be to not be overwhelmed with the stress of life and switch into automatic pilot and being reactionary instead of deliberately responding to the question of who do I want to be in this instance. We all have the potential to be Hitlers. We all have the potential to be Mother Teresa. It's in each and every one of us. And that's the paradox of being human. But seeing each other's humanity, I think, is what the real hard work is. It's what you think about before you go to sleep at night. And to me, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, and you should definitely respond, but since they gave me a permanent mic. Um, <laughs> I, I think that what I see a lot, and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna leave, in fact, I have to leave here right at six because I have to go to this Hillary Clinton event. So I'm just, so that you know, I'm a partisan person. I, I, so I have a candidate in this race for president. And one of the things that I hear so much on our side on the Democratic side, the sort of anti-Trump side, is how those other people are so beneath contempt that we can't talk to them, right? I don't want the votes of these people who would support somebody or, or, or who's a racist or, or whatever. I mean, and that is where my sort of belief in you know, peacemaking and that I can talk to anybody and all of that, it gets tested is when somebody takes a position that to me, like for example, someone who takes a position that we should ban the entry of Muslims into my country, to me that's a, a hateful enough position that I don't think it's worth entering into a dialogue with that person. And that is, is real for me, I'm just saying, and it, 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 it's hard for people who show up at events like this to think about what it's like to enter into a dialogue with people who have positions that they believe are just reprehensible. But I would love to hear you, you don't have to comment on what I just said, but finish this, this, this dialogue. I just think that's another aspect of this that, that we all lose track of when we're in here talking about how open and honest we are. Well, what about the people that we don't like? Yeah, I think I agree with what everybody here is saying. And hi, Bethany. I mean, it's nice meeting you again because she was actually like visiting, uh, joining this Graduate Muslim Association barbecue just last Sunday and we had good chat. <laughs> and I think uh, it is like we talk about Brexit and everything. Uh, and uh, I think it's kind of barbecue. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah, it's the first one in, in, at Emory because sometimes like barbecue is very hard for us to go <laughs> when it's not the halal meat, so it's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so I think like I just want to say that this kind of like real things like even, yeah, just come to and we create space and like just in our everyday life actually connect with people that we don't think we want to connect or sometimes we are too afraid to connect because I know that I mean, I'm here in a strange country, you know, at first I also have my fear. But, you know, because I know that I'm here, they want me, I mean, I'm on Fulbright in the beginning, like they want me to connect, they want me to build my network. And, you know, after that, I mean, I mean, I see things that more positive than I thought. I mean, you know, mostly I know America only from Hollywood movie, right? <laughs> and I think I see more diversity. And I think, yeah, I see like they are human and they're like so many different human even within, you know, like one country and everything. And um, I think also I want to say that everybody, I'm not really doing social media that much now. I'm writing my dissertation. That's what I don't want my professor to know I'm playing so much. <laughs> and, but I think like what I can see because social media playing so much part of this, maybe like by sharing like positive meme, positive pictures, and sometimes like pictures of you, actually like hanging out with people that people think dangerous, <laughs> maybe it can really, really make difference. Because I know that sometimes people fight so much in their status, Facebook status. I know that some of my friends are still very frustrated, but you know, sometimes visual actually get the subconscious more effective. And I think if we can share like positive pictures in our Instagram, social, uh, tweeting and everything, maybe it's also like one step for peace that we can do for three seconds. Oh, yeah. I, love, I love that idea. Mm -hmm. We'll go there and then there, and we won't talk too long this time. <laughs> Quickly introduce myself. My name is Brian. I'm also part of the Masters in Development Practice program along with Bethany. Um, my question is um, you all have talked a lot about individuals tonight, um, working with individuals and workshops or dialogue. Um, but the ultimate goal of, of peace building would be peace at a global scale. Um, so I'm curious, how do you scale that up from working at an individual level? Sure. 
Dr. Elson has presented in four countries outside of the United States, and that's part of his commitment. If it works in one space and the other, we are on the micro level. Truly, um, you know, having run a campaign where we spent $30 million, you know, combined on the two sides, right? All of that was spent on conflict, essentially. Um, and, and that's just in a little state. I say little state. I mean, Georgia has 10 million people. It's the eighth biggest. It's going to be bigger than Ohio in the next year or so. So, I mean, it's a big state, but in the grand scheme of global peace, it's a pretty small one. But you still have to find ways uh, to bring people together. And I, I, I personally believe um, that, that the way that we do that is you've got to have inspirational leadership. Those leaders can't be alienated. They have to have be supported and believe that they can be effective at what they're doing. Um, and then they have to band together. And, and, and what that requires is, at the end of the day, individual personal courage on the part of a lot of people. And I think what we get in Georgia, for example, um, one place where we truly scale sort of community values is in our school system. You know, there's 1.8 million kids in our schools right now in Georgia. Um, and if we were teaching them about civics in a way that dealt with connection, if we were doing some of the stuff that, that these guys are doing, you know, you can scale that. Um, the other thing that you have to do is you have to look at the way to educate people in other parts of the world, right? And so if we can start to focus on what these generations have, uh, give outlets and for, for people to do it, um, then, then I think that's how you scale this ethic of, of peace. But, I, but these types of projects that seek out space for people uh, and ideas for people to rally around and then cultivate the kind of leaders that we're going to need to bring people along, uh, I think that's the only way. I mean, you know, the, what is the answer to world peace? It's a, it's a lot of people uh, who individually choose it. Um, that's it. And, and I think that, that that's the problem with, with, with peace on some level. But um, courageous leadership is hard. And it's hard, especially when you have a system that's designed, as we've just described, to, to, to uh, make it easier to win mm -hmm. if you point out differences. And, and, and good look, both sides in this current election are doing that, remember. It's not, you know, one side is, is doing it worse, but both sides are saying the other side is, is just so wrong that as to be beneath contempt. It's just one side happens to be right about that. <laughs> I do, and thank you. I am thrilled. Yeah. I hope you vote again. I uh, was a teacher. I'm here in Candler as a two-year student now, oh, so I feel like I was a teacher. But my question is, and I'm not sure who it would be directed to, but in terms of the Emory, um, J.C. Carter's, I'm sorry, Carter Center's partnership, what would be our next step for those of us that have come here and we want to, we want to jump in, we want to do something. What is the next step? Well, uh, first of all, you know, the Institute for Developing Nations is a, is a, is a collaboration between the Carter Center and Emory. And, and just so that y'all know, the Emory and the Carter, the Carter Center itself um, is, has a permanent and foundational connection with Emory. I mean, Emory University appoints half the Carter Center board. It is, it is a, a uh, partner at, at that foundational level with Emory. And so there are ways in which the Carter Center's programs and Emory uh, have collaborated in the past, for example, um, there's a variety of public health programs where uh, the Emory School of Nursing or, or the Emory School of Public Health has done stuff with the Carter Center. Um, there are another group of programs at the Carter Center that, uh, that are not health programs, but that are access to information programs, access to justice programs, uh, and other things that, that have taken and, and can take uh, a great number of interns, um, a number of, of sort of academic partnerships where people's scholarship uh, can, can get together. And she, for example, is, is, is one of these fellows within our uh, election observation program. Um, so there are those types of opportunities out there. And we, one of the things, excuse me, one of the things that, um, that we've been looking at at the Carter Center is how to just make sure that we take advantage of, of all of the opportunities that Emory has, that, that the platform has to, to offer and, and, and vice versa. But we're, we're still working on that. But, you know, we've, there's a huge amount of of collaboration that occurs, and there are some good opportunities out there, and IDN is a good place to, to, to go to find them. Thank you. You're welcome, and thank you again.
Like I said, I, my, my apologies in, in advance for having to run out, but um, I have to make it across town for this event. But thank you so much for having me, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. I'm not li literally running out right now, but I'm just <laughs> giving an indication that I will run out soon. But so we've, thank we've, you very we've, much. we've actually reached the, the end of this phase of the program, so I'd like to thank all of our, our panelists for... <laughs> And so we, we, we've had a fantastic uh, music earlier welcoming us into the Carlos Museum. Those uh, drummers will still be here. And so we invite you to stick around, enjoy the music, enjoy the festivities. As we've learned, art and peace are intricately connected and that we need to have fun as we make the world a better place. Thank you again for coming out.